the uh, ha hey everybody this is Professor Palmer and um, these are our online office hours uh, this will be the I want to ace the first exam edition uh, because if you watch this I think you should be in a much better place to uh, to do well in the first exam uh, I have a couple of questions over here that I'm going to look at and I will answer uh, get everyone ready for, for the exam the first one is, and I'm going to keep this one nameless. It says, "Can I be the first, or can I get extra credit for being the first person to hang out with you uh, during the online office hours?" And I would uh, answer that by saying, "If you hang out with me on the online office hours, I will give you extra respect and a lot of credit, but not extra credit." So, sorry. Um, the next question I got from about five people, and I think it's a pretty good one. It's, uh, "What's on the test?" and um, so for those of you who don't know, the test is 50 multiple choice questions. Um, some of them are um, longer form readings and then you answer multiple questions. Um, but by and large, it's uh, single question, uh, single answer kind of stuff. The questions are focused on concepts. They are not focused on definitions. They are not focused on names and dates. If you understand the concepts, you'll be okay on this test. If you understand these concepts and you're able to apply them to your life, you're able to rephrase them in your own words, excuse me, and you're able to come up with examples um, from, uh, I guess, just on your own, you'll be a, a much better off. So, excuse me. Uh, the test is really focused on concepts. Do you understand them? Can you use them? Are you really learning something? Um, a really effective way of studying is looking for concept pairs. So where, um, like take, we talked about this last time, ethnocentricity and cultural relativism, or let me think of another one, um, structure and agency. Uh, how does the conflict theory relate to structural functionalism? How do uh, conflict and structural functionalism relate to uh, symbolic interaction? So two ma macro theories compared to two micro theories. What is the relationship between correlation and causality? Um, for the answer, we should all be able to say, in unison, correlation does not equal causality. I hope that by the end of this semester you'll have memorized that if you haven't already. Um, but so look for those pairs, look for how they are related to each other, and then from that you should be able to understand it. Uh, today in class we talked about primary groups and secondary groups. Um, understand how those two things are related. Uh, what's the difference between uh, small groups, large groups, and parties? All right, yeah, small groups, large groups, and parties. How are those things all related to one another? Uh, don't just understand uh, things individually, understand them in relationships. So if you're a flashcard person, if you're really big on vocabs and definitions, then go for it. I think that's a really good way to start. I just think that that's unfortunately where too many students end. You gotta keep going, push through that, and go from memorizing the terms to being able to rephrase them in your own words, to be able to apply them to your life and create examples, uh, not create examples, but think of examples that come from the larger world um, and, and society as a whole. And when you can do all that, you're kind of taking a more active response. Something else that people asked um, was, uh, okay, it was about the reading and how to know if you're doing a good job with the reading and if you've read it enough and if you've understood it and all that. And I think that um, in preparation for this week and, and getting you the study guide put together, uh, something kind of, I read this article about how um, students typically feel that if they don't read from the first letter of the chapter to the last letter of the chapter, they didn't actually read the textbook. They just kind of, they, I guess, they halfway did it. And so I think that's uh, terrible. I think that's not true. You could read it from the first word to the last word and get almost nothing. Um, the best advice I can give you is to always be asking yourself a question when you're reading any piece of nonfiction, and that question is, what what am I trying? What is this? What is the purpose of this? What am I getting out of this? What is this teaching me? And if the answer is, I have no idea, then I think you could find your time better used by you know getting questions like that answered. Um, this isn't to say that everything has to be utilitarian or everything has to be towards learning something, but I mean, when you're reading anything, I'm always trying to figure out what is this trying to communicate to me. And so um, 
be smart, be judicious with your time, right? Like, uh, don't just read from the first letter to the last letter once. That's going to take up all your study time. Uh, start by reading the summary. Flip to the back of the chapter, and they have the, the summary there. Read that. Uh, go look at the lecture notes and read that. And once you have the lecture notes and the summary kind of understood, then go into the chapter and read the pieces that you think look really important. If you understand something through and through, then you don't need to read every word of that. Go focus on the stuff that is totally confusing um, and spend more time on that. But that's kind of what I'm trying to get you to see there is active reading and um, kind of turning yourself from a consumer of information to more of a producer. That's what you're doing when you rephrase things. That's what you're doing when you come up with examples. That's what you're doing when you apply it to your life. You're taking an active role and you're producing things. And when you do that, you'll be much better um, able to remember those things and you'll seem much more um, like familiar when it comes to test time. Okay, so enough about that. Uh, I have a really another simple question that I can answer. What kind of Scantron do I need? You need a little green one, skinny. Uh, the number is 25110. That's on the very bottom of the, of the Scantron. Okay, so let's go to the first question. Uh, the first question comes from Twitter, and it's Mackenzie Haley, and she asked if I could explain hegemony again. And I think that's a really good question, because uh, hegemony is all over this test, and it's going to be all over everything we do for the rest of the semester. All right, let's see if I can get my hands in the picture. Okay, so these are the, the, the people in power, and these are the people without power. So here's hegemony. Hegemony is how those with power convince those without power that it is in their best interest to do what is actually in the most powerful's best interest. Uh, another way of thinking about it might be to say it's kind of the Jedi mind trick, right? It's how we get people to do um, something that is not in their best interest when, uh, it, because people use power to get those without power to do what they want. Um, another way of putting it might be those in power use it to stay in power. Uh, let me give you an example of this. If the world is divided in unequal terms between haves and have-nots, then um, the have-nots are unlikely to be supportive of the haves, and they're unlikely to um, do what the haves ask them to. They're more likely to resent the haves and want to rebel against the haves. And so in this have-have-not kind of scenario, um, one of the tricks that the haves can do use is to convince the have-nots that they are just temporarily a have-not, that they're just about to be rich. Or as the lingo goes, they are soon to have. Um, John Steinbeck famously said that the problem with the poor in the United States is they don't see themselves as exploited proletariat, but rather as temp they see themselves as temporary, temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Um, forget everything about that ex that sentence, that quote, except for temporarily embarrassed millionaires. That's the key thing there. If everyone is just temporarily, you know kind of in between being a millionaire and being impoverished, then there is no haves and have-nots. There's haves and soon-to-haves. And in that environment, there's really no reason for anyone to be upset. And the haves can say, hey, we should pass this policy that benefits all of us haves. And don't worry, when you get to where we're at, you're going to be really happy that the laws are like that. And that's, that's a good example of, of hegemony. Um, when we get to Module 4, I'll definitely, we'll talk about haves and have-nots and hegemony and you know, economic hegemony in a lot more detail. Um, so sit tight for that, but it's, I'm going to do it one more time with raise the hands, right? It's how those with power convince those without power that it is in their best interest to do what is in the most powerful people's best interest. That's hegemony. Um, we, will, we will do that over and over and over and over and over again. Okay, um, so that's McKenzie's question. Okay, let's see. Another one I got um, from about five different people is what is the relationship between structure and agency? Okay, so structure is the aspects of society that I think for lack of, I mean, the easiest way to think about this is structure is like the hard landscape of society. Um, it's basically like the social institutions. Excuse me. So social institutions like the government, uh, education, media, health, family, 
uh, the natural environment, all these things have already made decisions for you. If the federal government comes out and says that it, if not even that, let's just pick something small, uh, you are pressured by your peers, by uh, media in the form of advertisements, especially from companies like uh, Lowe's and Home Depot and all these other places to, and then like uh, HGTV and things like that, to, we pressure people into thinking that a green, lush, green lawn is really important. Um, side note about that, uh, the original, like I guess the original motivation for a lush green lawn was uh, in Europe, if you were rich, you had a, a lot of sheep or a lot of uh, animals in your herd. And when that happened, you they would eat your grass. And so um, people who had tall grass weren't rich, and people who had short grass had enough livestock to eat it. So people started mowing their lawns so it looked like they were rich. <laughs> so that's why we have to mow our lawns today. And that's kind of interesting how we get to this like social construction of... Um, like beauty and the social construction of what a yard should look like and why does tall grass look ugly? You know, why does short grass look attractive? Interesting. Anyways, uh, so the there's a lot of pressure on us to clip our yards, to 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 buy um, riding lawnmowers, to buy um, fertilizers and all these other things. Um, and so we get pushed into we get a lot of suggestions, I should say, from structure, from society, from these institutions to manicure our lawns in specific ways. Now, um, we might do that. Um, some people care a lot about their lawns and are very, you know, kind of wear them on their sleeves, so to speak. But other people don't. And other people are like, you know what, I don't really care. Other people would say, you know, I don't even want a grass lawn. I want a lawn that's rock or I want a lawn that is you know, nothing but plants. In both of those examples, um, that is someone ex exerting their free will or exerting like their personal, what we call agency, their individualism, their, um, yeah, I guess that's individualism, agency, those are kind of the, 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 I guess I'm using the word to define the word, that's never good, but it's the individual kind of ability to do something against what the structure is saying. So structure guides most of your choices. Most of the things that you want to do during the day, um, the most of the things you do during the day are choices that are already made for you by um, the, you know, the government, uh, education, uh, your job, all these other things. So like, for example, if you wanted to drive on the left side of the road in the United States, you couldn't. You just couldn't. Okay, there's that. Uh, agency is the free will. Let's go back and think about the river metaphor that we've been using all semester long. If each one of us is like a drop of water in the river, then the river uh, moves along with the banks. The banks of the river then are the structure. They kind of direct the flow of all those drops of water. Now that water has, you know, so, so to speak, uh, free will. It can move to the left, it can move to the right, it can move up, it can move down. Um, but it's basically, um, if the banks of the river turn the river left, that water is going left. Um, now here's the thing though, just like in society, uh, sorry, how do I put this? A river is similar to society in the fact that the river can change. If the water wants to go in one direction, over time it can change um, the, the shape of the river. And just like if enough individuals it, it use their agency to push against the limits of the structure in their life, it can change the structure. If you um, went to high school recently, then your high school probably had a no cell phone policy. Well, some schools across the country right now have had such a problem, been so inept at getting cell phones out of the classroom, that they are now um, trying to find ways to incorporate cell phones into their classes. They're trying to find ways to um, have them be used for like polling and surveys and things like that, and get them to be used in a, in a productive manner. And so enough students broke the rules and in the in breaking the rules the structure realized that it wasn't able to prevent them from doing that and is now adjusting just like if the water pounds on the banks of a river long enough it will erode the river and it will eventually change the shape of the river 
and it goes back and forth. Sometimes things become um, the government says you can't do this, uh, and people change their behavior. Going back to the lawn analogy for a second, uh, in this drought we've been having na uh, nearly nationwide, uh, a lot of people have been unable to water their lawns uh, because their local governments have put a ban on it, sometimes state, but typically local governments have put a ban on it. So you don't have perfect free will. I mean, if the government says you can't water your lawn, well, then you don't water your lawn. Okay, so that's structure, that's agency. That's a pretty good pair though, right? Because we're looking at how these two terms relate to one another. Okay, let's talk now about the next question that someone asked, which was, what is uh, causality and how is it different from correlation? Uh, they are very related. Um, I think I should take a step back and talk about correlation. It's all in the name, co-relation, right? So we know co typically means like two or shared, right? And relation is short for relationship. So when two things have a relationship that is shared, we call that a correlation, a co-relation. That's what you have to think. So if I eat more calories, my weight will go up, right? Um, I gain weight if I eat calories. If I eat less calories, I lose weight. Um, that's a correlation. We also talked about the fact that um, as ice cream sales go up, so too does the murder rate. Full stop. Like that's true. Uh, that those things are correlated, um, but they're correlated, but they don't cause one another. What that means is, ice cream sales don't lead to murders. It's not like people get brain freeze and they go kill somebody else. The reason that murders go up when uh, the ice cream sales go up is because ice cream sales go up when it's hot, and so too does murder. Um, because the thing you need to kill someone more than anything else is access to other people and interactions. And so in the summer when it's hot, people interact more, you interact more, you have more opportunity for those interactions to go wrong. And when they do go wrong, you have more opportunity for them to go totally wrong and have someone die. Um, but uh, A does not cause B. A, ice cream sales, does not cause B, the murder rate. These things are correlated, but they don't cause each other. So what does it take to cause something? Three things. First, you have to have a correlation. So let's go back to the calorie thing for a second. I eat, cal or I eat a lot of calories, I gain weight. So there's a correlation. The second thing it has to have is temporal order, which basically means that you have to eat the calories and then gain the weight. A has to happen before B. If you gain weight and then eat calories, the calories that you consume did not lead to the weight you gained. That's number two. Uh, let's just stop for a second about the temporal order for a second. Uh, people, or time order is another way of putting it. Temporal order, time order, it means the same thing. Something can't cause something else unless it happens before that thing. That's basically what I'm saying. Number three, we have to rule out possible alternatives. So what that means is, let's just go through this one real quick. There's a, a relationship between the calories, in, the increased calories I consume and the fact that I'm gaining weight. The I ate the calories before I gained the weight, and then we gotta rule out alternative explanations. So maybe I'm having a thyroid problem, or like a gland problem, or some other thing that could lead me to be gaining weight. Once we rule those out, then we can say, yep, yeah, it's the calories you're eating. You're eating too many calories, and that is leading you to gain all this weight. So for something to be causal, it has to have those three things but there's lots of correlations. Um, you could, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised to find out like really strange things like uh, the, I guess, I don't know, as the, let's see, as more people watch television, like network television, trapper keeper sales go up. If you don't know what a trapper keeper is, ask your mom and dad. <laughs> I think that was my generation, not yours. Um, okay. So let's see what are, what other questions we have here. We got one just came in over Twitter. It's okay. It asks us if I can explain dramaturgy again. Sure. Uh, dramaturgy is uh, is very related to symbolic interaction in the sense that it's a micro theory. It's looking at things at a very by micro it means a, a small level, right? The opposite of micro is macro. Those are like when the things look at like the big picture. Uh, micro is looking at individual instances. Um, so right now, a symbolic interactionist uh, might look at what I'm doing right now 
talking to my laptop and the little green dot right next to the, the lens and see how I'm using the symbols to communicate and share um, my version of reality with you in the hope that you will can you know understand those and then create the same how do I this create the same reality that I'm trying to get you to create because um, if you stop and think about it for a second right there I'm alone in my office with the door shut and there's a lamp in my face right there and I'm talking to my laptop um, it's very likely that some people, especially if they don't realize that there's this is being broadcast, they might think that I am, have become mentally unhinged and uh, judge me accordingly. <laughs> but, okay, that's not answering the question about dramaturgy. I'm trying to take a step back and talk about symbolic interaction. Dramaturgy is, is it's all in the name. Drama, like the drama club, theater. So dramaturgy is looking at individual situations in theatrical terms. So we talked about front stages and back stages. We talked about performances. Uh, right now, I am performing to you um, to try to, I guess, successfully communicate that I'm a professor and that I care about your learning and that I want you to do well on this test, and et cetera, et cetera. The interesting thing is I'm alone in my office with the door shut. The door's over there. It's shut. And so in a way, this is kind of my backstage. But the really kind of interesting thing is that um, because of that little camera right there and the fact that there are people viewing, which everybody, I'm glad I can see that you're viewing now. Yay. But there are people viewing, this kind of becomes a front stage. I'm performing again. This isn't, you know, me doing my spiel. Um, but so front stages and back stages. Front stages are where the performance happens, and back stages are where we prepare, prepare for that performance. Um, in our backstages, we're free to, you know, do whatever. Uh, we don't feel the stress of being watched or performing, so to speak. So, like, uh, when I'm at home and I'm, you know, getting ready for bed, I don't wear a polo and, and khakis and, you know, my work clothes. Uh, I change clothes and I wear things that I would never wear into the classroom because those are that's backstage clothes. Um, and actually, not just clothes. I forgot to, beyond front stages and backstages, we can also get into... Um, costuming, lines, uh, blocking, uh, the whole, everything about theater all kind of holds up when we're talking about um, individual interactions. I should have also probably said the old uh, Shakespeare quote, you know, uh, the world is but a stage, and we're the, the world, the, all the world's a stage and we are but its players. Sorry, Will, William, William Billy, Shakespeare. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's dramaturgy, I think. Think about it like a performance. Think about it like theater. And remember how we talked about in class that you perform in the classroom as much as I do, that you're trying to perform as a student. Some of you are trying to perform as a good student. And, oh, I didn't want to talk about failed performances a little bit. So we're all trying to perform on our front stages, but oftentimes we have mistakes, and we make mistakes. When we do that, this is called um, a failed performance. So if I'm giving a lecture and I misspeak, then um, someone might do like one of those like kind of huh, laughs, or they might go raise their hand and say, hey, uh, Professor Palmer, uh, did you mean that? Because I, I don't think that's what you meant. And uh, you communicate to the presenter in a polite way that they have failed in their performance. Um, we also do things like we look away, uh, when someone fails in a performance, or we pretend that we're not there, or whatever, whenever someone is just not doing a, a good job. So maybe, um, how about this? What, what is what is this more of a wardrobe malfunction than realizing your fly is down, right? So you've been walking around all day, and people are laughing. Uh, by the way, another way that we communicate to someone pol rather politely, not totally politely, but you know that they have failed in the performance is a, a little chuckle, a little laugh. Um, Sometimes they're fly down, right? They're, they they left the barn door open. Well, when that happens, that's a failed performance. That's a, a costume malfunction. And so when that happens, we tend to like politely tell someone, like, "Hey, um, just so you know, you know, your fly's down, or oh, you got a, you got a booger, or you know, whatever it is." We don't typically go, "Hey, everybody, Bob's got a booger," or "I can see his boxer shorts. Look at that!" Uh, right? We don't bust them out. We uh, we help them. We protect the performer. Um, 
this is also, I think, perhaps most obvious if you've ever walked in on someone getting dressed or toweling off after the shower or otherwise naked. Um, we, as soon as we see that, we turn away. We, oh, and we kind of shield our eyes as if we looked at them when they were, you know, in a failed performance. It would burn our retinas out or something like that. Um, and that's because the interesting thing and the thing that you want to remember is the responsibility for perform. How about this? It's not just the responsibility, but I would say more often than not, the responsibility for the performance is on the audience. When a performer fails, the audience comes in and um, picks the performer back up. The audience seems to have a just as strong, if not stronger, investment in making sure that the performance uh, goes off without a hitch. Um, so front stages where we perform, back stages where we get ready for the performance. Uh, the audience protects the performer, not the other way around. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Oh, we talked a lot about openings and closings. And so like if you see me on campus and we're walking by, you're gonna go, hey Professor Palmer, and I'll go, Oh hi, Jill, or whatever, right? Well, the waving and the, you know, hey, and then my name is an opening. If I'm walking on campus and we haven't made eye contact yet. Um, or we have made eye contact even, but we haven't had the opening. We haven't had the hey or the or, or whatever it is that we're gonna do, then typically people will pretend like they don't see each other until there's the opening. So openings are how we talk to you know, we start a conversation and we will ignore people until they have given us an opening. Secondly, uh, like I always think about like at parties or like at like gatherings. Or like, let's say there's a meeting, and then you really want to go talk to somebody, like that you you really you think they're really important, or like you really want to like you know have them think you're cool or whatever it is, and so you like walk up to them to say something, but they're like in the middle of a conversation with somebody else, so you're gonna roll up on them, they're talking, and you don't want to be rude because it's like their private conversation, and you don't want people to think that like you don't want either of them to think that you're listening to them or that you're like you know eavesdropping. And so you kind of like stand around them, like near them, that says, hey, I want to talk to you. But then you're just kind of like, looking around, not, if they're over here, not looking at you, not looking at you, not listening, do, 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 do. But then someone else will come up, right? And it looks like they want to start talking. So then like you get a little bit close to them, but you don't, you know, still not making eye contact, still giving them the space or whatever. And then as soon as they're done, you go, Oh, hey, George, I wanted to talk to you, right? And so without that opening, we kind of pretend like we don't see people. In fact, it's obvious that we do, but you try to give people space. Okay, so that's openings. Closing, closings, on the other hand, are how we end a conversation. So it's something like, okay, well, thanks so much now. All right. Oh, really? That's great. Okay. Well, we should talk about that next time. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye-bye now. Okay. Sure. Okay, bye-bye. All right, and we do you hear it, especially on phone conversations, um, where we, the, the endings, uh, so the closings, are much more pronounced. And really, so are the um, openings. When you call someone, you know, you say, hey, it, you know, Omar, what's going on? You know what I mean? It's Nate. And then you talk to them. So there's your opening. And when you're done, you're like, all right, I'll talk to you later. And then you, that's it. Right, so openings, closings. Um, it's kind of like your exits and your entrances on the theater. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Let's see. We have two more questions. All right, the fourth question, or whatever number it is, is what is the fundamental attribution error? That's a really good question because I think students get stuck on that. The fundamental attribution error is best defined as the reason you do things is because of your circumstances. The reason you do things is because of your circumstances. The reason other people do things is because of who they are. So if you've ever been in trouble, like, you know, either like with the campus police or, you know, at your high school or maybe even like the, the straight up police, like, like really in trouble, then I'm sure if I were to ask you to explain what happened, you would probably say, give me an explanation that was uh, involved and talk about how complex it was and how there's all these little idiosyncrasies about it and all these like tiny little details and everything like that. Um, and it'd be like, well, look, the reason I got in trouble, it's a long, complex story 
but you know, here's what it is. And in the end, most people, when you ask them why they got in trouble for something, they would say that they kind of got caught up in something, and it was this huge kind of thing, and they didn't understand totally what was going on, and then after all of these things, they made a choice that they wish they didn't, or sometimes they say things like, I didn't even make the choice, it's just kind of wrong place, wrong time situation. But they have this huge explanation for how it happens, if you can get them to be honest and like open up about it. However, why do other people commit crimes? If you read in the newspaper that so-and-so robbed a bank, right, you might just go, oh, well, they're a bank robber. The reason they robbed the bank is because they're bad people. They're a bad person. So the reason you get in trouble for things is a long, convoluted story that it's going to take half an hour to explain. The reason other people did things, or other reason other people get in trouble is because they're bad people. Um, that's the fundamental attribution error. The reason that other people do things is because of who they are as a person. Their fundamental attributes. Right? We fundamentally attribute their behavior to themselves as a person. Right? So it's their fundamental nature. Um, the other example that the classic example when we talked about this in class was uh, driving a car. So uh, if you're driving a car, you're speeding. You're speeding someplace. Uh, chances are the reason you sped was because um, you had to have your circumstances. You were going to be late for work. You were about to deliver a baby. Your wife was about to deliver a baby. Um, you were going to miss class or you were already late for a test or whatever. But there was a reason you sped. Now, when we talk about other people, like you're driving your car and then all of a sudden like someone cuts you off real fast. You don't stick your arm out the window and go, I'm sure you have your reasons. Right? You stick your arm out the window and you curse at them and say things like, I hope that you get stopped, you maniac. Um, so other people, when they are, the reason that other people speed is they're bad drivers. They're reckless drivers. They're a danger to society. The reason you speed is because of your circumstances. So that's, that's the fundamental attribution error. Okay, it's time for the last question. If you have any final questions, do send me an email uh, or hit me up on Twitter. I don't think there are any other questions yet. I'm checking. Hold on. Uh, nope, no new questions. All right, here we go. Last question. Uh, and it says, what points should we focus on with everything is obvious? Okay, that's kind of the the cousin of the question, what do we need to know about this for the test? <laughs> so uh, I think a more holistic understanding is always better than, than you know, kind of just understanding a few bullet points of it, but I think I can kind of crystallize this down a little bit. Um, well, first of all, I can say I don't think any of the questions from the reading quizzes, the, the, what say? Yeah, the reading quizzes are on the test. I, I think I wrote all new ones, if I remember correctly. Um, but here are the things I would focus on. What is common sense? When is it dangerous? When is it beneficial? What is it good for? What is it bad at? That's the first thing. Those two things, right? I said that th three ways, but it's basically the same thing. What's it good for? Why is it dangerous? There you go. Uh, in addition, I would say how is common sense different than you know STEM fields like other sciences like science, technology, engineering, and math? So how is uh, common sense used in ways that no? I, I, let me go to this one because I think it's pretty confusing. So common sense is not trying to make laws, or it's not trying to say in every situation this thing is true. Um, it's trying to say. Uh, like if you think about the aphorisms we talked about, so like look before you leap, but he who waits is lost. Or birds of a feather flock together, but opposites attract. Right. So we have these things where common sense is really good at looking in the past, first of all, and second of all, it's really good at kind of discrete, small situations. Um, so if you should have been more cautious, you say, up, oh, look before you leap. But if you common sense says you should have, you know, taken the risk. Then you say, ah, I, you know, he who waits is lost. Sorry for the sexism. Uh, but um, so common sense is good at that. Common sense, like in science, we don't say, um, you know, gravity applies. You know, every time something falls, it must have been gravity. 
we say gravity is a force between two masses, and as long as there are two masses present, that force will be exerted. All right? So STEM sciences, sociology, psychology, political science, they're trying to say in all situations like this, this is true. Um, but if you ever like dated somebody or started to date somebody and you weren't sure if they were good for you or not, um, and maybe some of your friends said you shouldn't be with that person, and some of your other friends said you know that that person was good for you, and you couldn't tell which one to which way to go. Well, you know, in that situation, it'd be nice to know if this is a um, don't judge a book by its cover, or if this is a if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a duck kind of situation. But common sense tells you to give someone a second chance. At the same time, don't give anyone a second chance. So it's totally contradictory. Um, science, findings in science can't be contradictory like that. Um, they can't be like fundamentally, diametrically opposed contradictory. I mean, we do find things that challenge what we already know and things like that. But by and large, um, common sense is only used valuably in like discrete, small situations. Okay, uh, I'm trying to think. What else do you need to know about? Common sense, or sorry, everything is obvious once you know the answer. Um, I think that's basically it. I think that uh, well, that's not it, but that is definitely the the ones that you would definitely want to focus on. Um, you might also talk about the errors of judgment we make with um, human uh, judging human behavior, things like that. But okay, I think that covers it. So i got about six minutes left, and I want to finish up by reiterating what I said at the beginning. Um, you need a Scantron, skinny green one, 25110 is the number that should be at the bottom. Uh, the test is on Monday uh, in class. You don't need to bring your clickers. There will be no clicker questions on that day. Um, the best way to study is to um, read and understand a concept, then apply it to your life, rephrase the definition in your own words, and then try to come up with another example that's not provided in the book or we didn't talk about in class that illustrates that situation. Um, also look for concept pairs, so two words that um, relate to one another and make sure that you understand how they relate to each other. Uh, I think that's basically it. If, if you've watched all of this, if you've done the reading, if you've read the lecture notes, if uh, you, know, you study with other people, I have a feeling you're going to be great. You're going to do great on this test. At least I hope so. Um, but this, I'm going to sign off now, but uh, you can always come to my office hours. I have office hours from 1230 to 1.30 on Friday. You can drop me an email, npalmer at georgiasouthern.edu. Um, you can even ask me a question on Twitter. That's uh, at, at Prof Palmer GSU. Jeez, I can't figure out any other way to make it easier to get in touch with me. But uh, come to class on Friday. Ask me a question before or after class face-to-face. -face. I'd love to chat with you. Uh, that's it. All right. Take care, guys. Have fun. Good luck studying.